Hi everyone, this is the second episode of the Fast LED podcast and today will be a practical episode. Also, I updated the production equipment a little bit here. So I got myself here a microphone and the camera. So that allows you to see what I see and at the same time to see the screen and how I'm doing it. Also, I added here a picture of myself, not because I feel that adds any value to the content, but sometimes, sometimes I really like to speak with my hands and my body and maybe that extra channel supports the understanding. Everything we are going to do today will be based on a very little code, which you see already. And I put a link down here where you can find the bare version of that in order to play with it yourself. Short interruption from the future me. This code as it is relies heavily on the presence of a hardware floating point unit. So that means specifically a TNC 3.6 or TNC 4 or an ESP32 version S3. Like this is the platform this is meant for. You might get away with a TNC 3.2 or similar similar processes, but there the frame rates will be in order of magnitude smaller at least. So just to be clear, this is not going to run on an 8-bit Arduino. For the beginning, let's take a moment and appreciate the quality of this rendering algorithm I put together here. At the moment, you look at it through a diffuser. And as you can see, even in this pretty challenging scenario, meaning very slow movements on a very low resolution, with a bit of diffusion, you see that it totally blends together and there is no flickery edges, no. No pixels jumping in and out of existence. No temporal discontinuities. So I'm pretty proud of that, to be honest. Like, this is really as good as it gets and will be a very solid base for everything we're going to do. Maybe a bit background in case it's, it's not obvious. The 8-bit color resolution of LEDs is a problem, like it really sucks, specifically in the, in the low brightness area. And that requires it to calculate with high precision in order to allow its move transitions that really the pixels very slowly come into existence really step by step, starting with zero, one, two, three, the brightness and do that in a very smooth way. That's one of the reasons why I usually insist on high frame rates, because uh, you really want these transitions at a, at a low brightness area to be time wise, absolutely spot on. Meaning that if that runs only with 20 or 50 frames, you see unsteady edges. Like it looks okay, but when you really look at it at a slow animation, you see that multiple pixels change brightness at the same time. And that just looks not cool. Unlike here, where at the moment it runs at, I don't know, 800 frames per second or something, where these transitions are time wise absolutely precise and basically every single pixel has its own timing for the brightness change and yeah that allows then when you average over it and look at it that it looks perfect if i might say so yeah this is the engine we are going to use and in the code. I might come later to it and explain a little about it. But enough about the basics. Let's get to the code and play with it. My personal opinion is 
it's really boring to watch someone typing code. So this is the reason why I did all this before. And we are only going to, to play with the interesting part. Later we will go through it and have a, have a look at interesting details of it. But this is really meant to be a practical episode and I want you to get a feel and, uh, and uh, a bit experience with, with all that stuff. So it's not required to have absolute fully in-depth understanding and being able to write it yourself. You are welcome to just use the code and focus on the creative part, like really on the, on the, on the aspect of putting an animation together yourself without wasting your time on technical detail. So this is really meant for the creative people. Okay, let's stop that animation and upload the code as it is. The last time we spoke about polar coordinates and this year basically is the implementation of it. For now, we will have the polar origin at a fixed position. So in that example here, exactly in the middle of the LED matrix. You are absolutely welcome to change that here. Here is the position of the center defined. The advantage when we don't move the center during runtime is that basically we can pre-calculate all the polar coordinates and put them into a lookup table. That's exactly what we do here. The reason behind that is that they are, the coordinates are computational, quite expensive, meaning they eat time. So if we have them pre-calculated and then just take them out of the lookup table when we need them, we save a lot of time, which first of all allows high frame rates and second of all allows us to play with more layers before the frame rate collapses to unusable. Maybe, I mean, very, very basic here, set apart, open a serial connection that we can use the serial monitor, which you see down here, where I basically all the time keep an, keep an eye on the current frame rate and performance which helps me to spot possible mistakes I make early because if the, if the performance drops quickly, then usually I did a mistake. Stuff like calculating parameters for every pixel instead of for every frame. Talking about that, community member Zuta Barroso supported me a lot in getting this here together. I wrote the initial code and was pretty unhappy with the performance at the beginning. And Zuta Barroso kindly took the time to look through it, point out some stupid mistakes I made. And yeah, in general, it was really, really a big support to get this here together. And even if I had a specific question like I had something going but the code looked ugly it looked really ugly so I asked them in the middle of the night hey look it works but how would you write it and he could answer every single of my questions so man thanks a lot your support is appreciated let's have a look at the basic structure of the code it starts with including fast LED library then there is the width and height of the matrix defined. You might want to change that according to your to your own setup. And then there's a big chunk of global variables. I know it's considered bad style, or it's not just considered bad style. It is bad style, but I'm I'm a hobbyist coder, and I was very happy that I got it working, and I'm 
totally open to have the have the code optimized and cleaned up further later. But here I really focused on the on the creative part and to get it going. Later we might not we might uh, that needs a rework anyway. Uh, specifically when we when we use this code on uh, multi-core processors like an ESP32 and want to leverage parallelization of the stuff. Basic setup part, open a serial connection in order to have the, the serial monitor or the serial plotter available. Then here the, we define which kind of setup we use. You might want to go for that line, like here you just put in your data pin and your LED type, like everything as you know it. I, I assume you have used fast LED before. If not, then please have a look here at GitHub for basic usage. There it's all explained how to get this up and going. Then there's the main loop and the following things happen. For every frame, here are a bunch of, of variables, which basically are the time basis for some oscillators or moving offsets, which we can use later. So here are the ratios of them defined, or you could call it the frequency or the, the length of the period. Basically, they, these numbers define the proportion of the oscillators to each other. We will come to that. The numbers are here defined for now. They are static. Later, they could be dynamic, but we, we start really easy. Ratios designed. Then we calculate all kinds of oscillators, which we can use later. Just for a brief look, basically is all based on the internal millisecond counter. Which, which represents the run times and startup. Then we adjust this with a global speed setting. Then here we set the individual ratios for the counters. And based on that, like these are the linear C, D, E, F. It's basically a constantly raising number over time. This is for, for linear transitions. And in the next chapter here, we have angular offsets, meaning that these are numbers which all the time go from zero to type P, uh, to 2P, back to zero, back to 2P. And that, so, uh, that creates basically a sawtooth sine wave. And that allows us to do all kinds of trigonometry within the loop without having it too expensive by giving it ridiculous high angles and by that slowing the functions down. Again, thanks to Zutaburosu for pointing that out. So here, this function keeps it in a small range. Next chapter, we have here some direction variables. All, again, they are all based on the same counters and they return values from minus one to one, which we can, which we can use, yeah, as I said, to change directions of effects, for example. And independent from the linear offsets, from the angular offsets and from the direction multiplicators. Here I added a bunch of noise oscillators, which basically uses a one-dimensional noise function, travels through that and gives us just random numbers with a, with a smooth gradient in between. So unlike, unlike the, the sine oscillator, which produces a repeating graph. Here it's more or less unpredictable and by that interesting. So yeah. Back to the back to the main loop. Speed, calculate oscillators. 
then all these numbers are known now. Now we go through all the metrics and go through every single pixel. So through all the X and all the Y values and there happen the following things. First, we pick the polar coordinates of the pixel we are at right now. And we do that here by just getting it from the lookup table. How does the lookup table come into existence? It's this little, this little part here, which is entirely based on the, on the last episode where I explained how, how the polar coordinates are calculated. And this year puts that simply in practice. It's really just that. So first of all, we calculate here the, the deltas, meaning that the polar origin as specified by center X and center Y is somewhere. And uh, in order to get then the, the distance from the Cartesian origin, we go here for delta X and delta Y by just looking for the, for the difference. And based on these two values, then we get the distance from the origin and the angle from the, from the origin line. So this is basically all I talked about the last time for half an hour here in, the, in a very brief piece of code. After we have the distance and we have the angle stored here. Now we come to the manipulation of the value. Last time I, I called it what we can do to that polar coordinates. And that's what we are going to talk about today specifically. In a very trivial case. We would just say the new angle stays exactly the old angle and the new distance stays the old distance. Meaning nothing moves, nothing happens. And this is exactly what you see right now in the LED picture. It is static because nothing happens. Now, instead of leaving the values as they are, we can do things to them. For example, let's take the angle we just found in the, in the lookup table and let's add, I don't know, pi to them. I would expect the resulting frame to be 180 degree rotated. Let's see if that somehow makes sense. So here we have here this characteristic blob. Let's see if that moves to the upper left. Voila, it does. So one pi equals 180 degree rotation. You might find that boring. Then let's, instead of adding a constant value, let's add an angular oscillator. Let's say we start with angle C. So we have the angle we had, and here we add an offset that always goes from zero to type uh, to two p to pi, and theoretically that should result in a constant smooth rotation of the whole picture around the center point. It happens, but it's very slow because it's still the speed I set in the very first demonstration. So let's speed this up by a factor of 10. Here, let's see, we move on zero, and now it should rotate 10 times quicker. Voila, there we go. 
Maybe it makes sense if I put on the diffuser at this point. Because it's not so, not so useful to look at LEDs which are totally bleeding out here optically anyway. So maybe this makes it better. Another thing you might find useful is what happens when you multiply the original angel with a integer value. So let's say in, instead of keeping the angle as it is, let's say we double it. The result is that now the whole, the, the, the whole polar space is basically wrapped two times around, meaning we have a very, very basic kaleidoscope effect. And while you maintain this doubling, you can do anything else to the angle, to the, to the angle like rotating it or later make a spiral, whatever. But you can push it further, let's put it three. You showed you quite a bunch of videos where I use these three, three arm or three sector basic look. And there you have that. You have to keep a bit in mind how limited your resolution is. So if you put in something ridiculous here on a 16 by 16 matrix, like having eight arms, it becomes flickery and, and pixel salad because the resolution is just not enough. You might find this interesting, but this is uh, beyond the scope of my intentions here to create stuff like that. So yeah, three, four, maybe five like, is possible. If you, if you have a large matrix, yeah, if you have here yeah, 32 by 32 or something, this totally shines like you there you can do very nice interference effects on the on the outside area of an animation but on a 16 by 16 i would really recommend to keep it in the low range let me show you something else about the uh, oscillators here the angle at the moment we just double it and before we added a linear offset for a constant rotation. Um, angle C, it was that, right? For a continuous turning. Yep, that's what it does. So, what happens if instead of the, the sawtooth waveform, we add a noise oscillation. So this is here, the thing which gets calculated down here. And basically it uses the one dimensional noise function and just travels through it over time and gives back the current value. And well, here, and that should result in a non-periodic movement. So you see, depending on the current value, it goes back and forth, but in a kind of unpredictable way, unlike, unlike a sine function, where it's repeating again and again. Here, the angle and, the, and the, the moment is basically random and could, for example, add even another noise oscillator with a different frequency, frequencies as defined here, C and D, so the one is 13, the other 17, and now I add both of them in order to get the interference as a result. And that means that the movement becomes even more unpredictable, more organic, and by that 
in my, in my eyes more interesting. So this is just more pleasing to watch it when, when it's not so obvious what happens next. These are just two noise oscillators. And while we maintain this back and forth movement as we have it, we of course could also again add just the constant rotation to it. So that was angle C. Now there should be a continuous slow rotation while the back and forth continues. That's not so obvious. Let's say we take here E and let's say we make E way faster. So you see, overall, there is the rotation, but the rotation is not with a constant speed, because the noise oscillators influence it. We, we go here a bit slower, we could even come to a point where it stops or shortly goes backward. Let's see if that works. <coughs> so you have the constant rotation, but of course the noise oscillators also can be negative. It influences the speed and if the if the noise oscillators both together happen to have a bigger value than the angle oscillator, then you see it's stopping or shortly going backward. Oh, we are close to that edge here. Let's say 20, then it will happen for sure. That goes a bit back. And again. So yeah, you get the idea what you what you can do there. Now all we've done so far is basically manipulate every single angle in the same way. But beside this, here we have the flexibility that we can manipulate the angle depending on what the LED position is. So let's say, for example, if we have here the center, right? And from the center, here's a distance, and this is a distance, and here the distance is maximum. So how about we manipulate the angle depending on the distance? Let's just subtract it here. And let's say we take the distance, which is here, the, which is coming from the lookup table, what we have pre calculated. So the distance here, it's uh, 16 by 16. So this is 8. 8 square is. 64, Pythagorean theorem, 128, square root 128 is something, 11 something, should be the edge. So let's subtract an offset which depends on the distance. Voila, there you have the spiral effect. And basically with this number here, you can influence how, how strong the effect is. 
um, yeah, just to show that if you go for a slower number, the effect gets bigger and uh, can pretty much escalate that until it becomes pixel salad again. Yeah. Maybe let's get rid of the doubling here. Oh, there you can do these kind of things. I think you get an idea. And just to give you an idea about these directional offsets, or these directional multiplicators here, which go from minus one to one. Look, we could could here have it divided by this number, but multiply that with directional C. Oh no, it, it ends up in division by zero, doesn't it? Works anyway, interesting. Okay, but you, you see the idea, depending on the... Uh, if, it, if it's positive or negative, here the subtraction becomes an addition, and that basically defines the... if the spiral turns left way or right way, and how far. And at this point, I would like to stress that the little flicker you see here in the in the video is just in the video. Like in real time, it looks really smooth. Yeah, and if we could do this a bit more extreme. Oh no, we divide by it. We do it a bit more smooth now. It gets not twisted that far and stays a bit more in this figure and this still recognizable part. But you see, the whole value now is always smaller than what we add here. And by that, we don't get this forth and back rotation. So just for fun, let's say we want to triple the intensity of the spiral effect. And there you see, it comes more accentuated, while the overall rotation stays in place. So yeah, basically by, by stacking such simple equations together here, you can create pretty complex movements as you like. And you can do it an analytical, logical way and start with a clear idea of what you want to do, or you can more or less just play with it and check out what happens. So all, all I'm showing you here is meant to inspire you to play with it. Yeah. So for today, so much to the spirals. All right, let's talk about some of the other parameters here you can play with. And down here, for example, you see offset X and offset Y. And these are Cartesian offsets, which you can use for horizontal and vertical scrolling. So let's say if we say this offset is an ever increasing number, namely 10 times the linear C oscillator, I would expect a scrolling XYs. Yeah. 
Oh, damn it. I, I mixed up X and Y somewhere. But it doesn't matter for, for now. Um, don't let it disturb you, but it should be both in a different direction at least. So if we put in here linear C times 10, then that now should be horizontal scrolling. There we go. Okay. By combining the manipulation of the Cartesian coordinates, you can do interesting things too. Like, let's say you have these linear scrolling here in one dimension, and in the other dimension, you start at a random point and you add, let's say, 10 times the directional oscillator. So that should produce some left right wobble now, additional to the scrolling. Let's see if that works. There you go. Moves to the left, stops to the right. Like it's a basic sine wave, right? And there also you could use the noise oscillator or combined oscillators or whatever. Like you can can go really wild and become creative with that. Then let's say we keep that movement as it is come back to the angle and add here let's say angle c the constant rotation on top of everything we do already and there the movement comes already kind of complex Again, the flicker is here just the camera. The animation itself is smooth. So, but you get the you get the idea here yeah, how you can all that stack together. Maybe another thing we didn't talk about distance at all. Just let me show you a very short one. Like in instead of leaving the distance as it is, we could shorten the distance by taking the square root of it and that then creates such a magnifying glass lens effect at least it should Yeah, it looks not as clean as I wish, but you you get the idea. Yeah, you can manipulate the, the distance as well. Earlier I said I wanted to walk you through the basic structure of the program, and I didn't do this yet, so let's do it now. We go through all the pixels, we get the distance and angles from the lookup table. We set all the parameters in a way we enjoy. And then we call render pixel based on all that stuff and save the result in show one. And render pixel, this is the basic core of all this magic and it's ridiculously compact and short. So as I explained in the last video, it basically transforms the polar coordinates back into the Cartesian ones by multiplying here new angle or the, the cosine function of the new angle with the new distance, other dimension sine with new distance, then that result gets multiplied by the scale, which I didn't talk about yet. And here the Cartesian offsets we just played with right now. So that is the base for the new Cartesian, new x and new y 
and this we feed into the three-dimensional noise function get the result and then filter and scale the result a bit here and we get a value back that is somehow between 0 and 255 but still is a 32-bit value and by that maintains a full full precision here yeah? which uh, will turn out to be very useful for for later when we tour and we play with multiple layers yeah pixel uh, pixel value gets rendered it's saved and then rendered values get here assigned to the colors like if we leave it just as it is could for example if we assign exactly the same to red then instead of green we will have some kind of yellow right and if we add only half of it then should be some orangish no other way around um, half of green but full red so there orange more yellow but let's call it dark orange all right now really cool thing here is that you can do this with as many layers as you want so let's say you copy this whole block here bum, bum, and in here we need a new variable i have predefined up to five as i said and uh, as global ones but just for you to know so let's say here we talk about a, a second layer and yeah go back to the original distance and here we take a different frequency and here as well and maybe a different starting point to have it not too much overlapping and maybe we change the amplitude of the wobble a bit yeah just and now assign this result yeah from that these parameters get rendered the result gets rendered into that variable and this we simply assign with blue there you see you have two entirely independent layers as overlays and then you can just just we will we will talk about merging methods and uh, how to how to combine layers in creative ways in, in a, at another time but just very shortly can do for example here i don't know could subst just subtract them from each other by that color part of one layer by another one So yeah, I see that then basically acts as a as a color filter mask. Stuff like that. Uh, you can do pretty wild things here because because uh, the result like is color mapping and then it gets written to the frame buffer, but before that happens render pixel map float. Yeah, right pixel to flame frame buffer. First, we do a little sanity check for the RGB values, and that has a reason. Like, the final values are supposed to be in a range of 0 to 250. No, 255. And if you 
undershoot that, like having values lower than zero, it doesn't matter because they they just will be ignored. The problem is if you end up with a higher value, that causes a very um, like 255 is full brightness and if you go a little bit further you are back at black and that causes flickering so for the sanity check here in case the value gets negative because you did something wild then we just uh, mirror that back into the positive space right so that we don't discard possibly interesting results we just mirror it into into the zero zero to positive space and the second step we check if any of the values is higher than 255 and if so we make sure it stays there at this maximum in order to avoid this flickering here yeah? that's why the simply sub uh, subtracting the layer works here or why I can do that without concern could also for example I could uh, add them together for a bit more intensity so yeah you get the basic idea here yeah? how that how that works let's Get here, get that a bit not so bright. It's also a thing I would like to show you. Let's come back to the subtracting that here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is, because we here still have 32-bit resolution, we can do things like look at it, look at animation, and just go, hey, you know what? Let's keep it as it is, but I would enjoy it a bit more red. So we can simply here add a factor and say, I don't know, give me double of the red as before without being concerned of overshooting because uh, if it bleeds out into full brightness, it, it stays full brightness. Nothing, nothing bad happens. So, there we go. The whole thing is more bright, yeah? I think you, you get the idea what's possible here. But again, uh, we will talk about these merging methods, methods in detail. Yeah, so much for today about very simple layer parameters. Let's talk about one more, one last. Let's get rid of the second layer. Um, that back to zero, blue to zero, and let's say red shows us layer one. Let's get rid of all the manipulation here. Linear scrolling is fine. So, are we back at pure linear scrolling? Yes, we are. I'm not going to talk about pearly noise in detail now. That will very likely will be an episode for itself. But, Perlin noise in general is a multidimensional gradient noise function and 
here we use a three dimensional implementation. So here we can move it in X and Y or Y and X because I did a little mistake. But there's also a third parameter, which is Z. And when we project Perlin noise, when we project a three-dimensional noise in a two-dimensional space, like here on a, on a 2D plane, which is the LED matrix, then we can use the third dimension basically as time. Meaning that if we go here, let's say, let's say 10,000 multiplied by, let's take linear C again, like an ever raising value, then we basically go through the third dimension and shift the projection plane, meaning that the structure of the noise itself will move. Let's do this a bit faster, that's more visible. And maybe let's get rid of the scrolling to get not too distracted. So let's come back to a standing still image but while the image is standing we are traveling through the third dimension and by that the noise structure or the projection we use changes and we have these kind of, of movements here yeah. just very very brief Here's a beautiful Wikipedia article about Perlin noise. I encourage you to read it and to find other sources. Pure noise looks something like that in a 2D space, but basically it looks like that. Yeah, it is a, like this here would be a four dimensional version, meaning one, two, three dimensions for X, Y, and Z, and the fourth dimension is time. Yeah, and what we are doing here is basically that we cut a slice through that cube and move the slice over time and use that as, as our projection here. I might talk about that later more but just that you have a very basic background in case you have never heard about Perlin noise. Very very cool thing and computer graphics wouldn't be as it is without that invention. So that's it for today. I hope you found it interesting and learned something new. You are very very welcome to download the code and play with that and Really looking forward to what you guys are going to create with it and what will come out of these tutorial series. You know the YouTube game? Please like, subscribe, share, comment, help the algorithm that this gains a bit traction and maybe later I even have the required amount of subscribers to have this channel monetized. So that would really help. And until then, I would say enjoy and let's see where this is going. Love you all. Have a beautiful weekend.